Hello and welcome to Healthcare Matters, where thought leaders come to discuss the intersection of medicine and the law. I'm your host, Mike Matre, and today's guest is Dr. Jonathan Terry. Dr. Terry is a board-certified osteopathic physician and surgeon, as well as a general psychiatrist. He directs an outpatient mental health program for a federally qualified health center across three counties in California. He works in a high-acuity inpatient psychiatric units and is a founding member of the technology company Desta LLC, which operates a consumer health database and virtual clinic. Today we're getting here together to discuss the topic of telemedicine. Welcome to Healthcare Matters, Dr. Terry. Thanks so much, Mike. I really appreciate the invitation to be on the show. Excellent. You're a proponent of telemedicine, and I was hoping we could begin by defining the practice of telemedicine. That'd be great, Mike. Uh, really good question to start. And, you know, for definitions, I always like to go with the American Telemedicine Association, or the ATA, which is recognized as one of the leading groups as an advocate and resource for those of us who do telemedicine. So how does the ATA define telemedicine? They keep it pretty broad. They say that telemedicine is the use of medical information that's exchanged from one site to another by any electronic communication involved with patient care. So what does this mean in practice? Well, this can include video consultation, kind of like the video conversation we're having right now. It can be transmission of still images and what we call store and forward, which has been great for dermatology, for radiology, things like that. It also includes e-health, uh, things like patient portals that many of us participate in, and even remote diagnostics, the opportunities to use technology to, say, listen to a patient's heartbeat or conduct vital signs across a distance. Well, telemedicine has been around for a while, but we're currently in uh, a, a period where the healthcare delivery system is in uh, going through rapid change uh, because of the Affordable Care Act of 2010. And how has the Affordable Care Act benefited or hindered the practice of telemedicine? So, Mike, you know, overwhelmingly, the Affordable Care Act uh, of 2010 has been really just wonderful for telemedicine. It specifically outlines that the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, or CMI, is able to develop these new care models that are focused on technology. There's also some funding and direction for studies in telehealth utilization, uh, especially in behavioral health, and it requires the accountable care organizations to enable different technological uh, foci. There are so many different advantages, really, for patient access and for providers. Uh, for Medicaid recipients specifically, one of the best advances comes in the area of home health and chronic conditions, which really expands the topic of in-home consultation services for patients who might not have the ability to seek in-person services for any number of reasons. Well, th that obviously seems like an, a definite advantage for somebody who is homebound. What are some of the other advantages of, of telemedicine to both the patient and the physician, and in what situations are these advantages uh, more pronounced? Really great question, Mike. Of course, we wouldn't be doing telemedicine if there weren't significant advantages uh, for both patient and provider. For starters, when I train my staff in the technology, I'll tell them in general about the acceptance. Some might be fearful, you know, the patient doesn't want to be seen over the TV, something like that. And I'll cite several studies showing that patients who see the doctor uh, over telemedicine, as opposed to the same doctor in a face-to-face -face study, will perceive that provider as being, first, more knowledgeable, and second, as having spent more time with the patient, which I think are two great things for, for a fragmented healthcare system. One of my favorite things, though, that I have to say about telemedicine, really, and, and the main reason that I use it in my practice, is for improved access. It can, of course, expand the reach of our providers beyond the walls of the clinic, beyond the walls of the hospital, bringing healthcare to the home, the school, the rural community, uh, the island to international recipients, things we couldn't do before. I do, in, in my experience, I do consultation psychiatry now for a migrant health center and a federally qualified health center that covers three counties in rural central California. So in one day, I might see patients across 13 clinics, a nearly 200-mile uh, area, all without leaving my office. Every single one of these patients is somebody who comes from uh, an underserved background who would have just tremendous difficulty in having the same sort of access with a local provider. On a similar note, I'll mention, you know, telemedicine is highly cost-effective. There are several studies that point at reduced healthcare costs, something we're all concerned about, 
through adoption of telemedicine and the efficiency that comes with it. The neat thing about this is while we used to require sort of specific technology for telemedicine, now we're doing it with our tablets and with mobile phones. There are a number of clinics that are doing uh, just using secure software that way. And with telemedicine, of course, you know, a third thing that I might mention is it's reasonable to believe we might be accepting convenience in some, in exchange for some sacrifice and quality. And, you know, I think that's a valid concern, but, you know, the data just doesn't show it. It's interesting. It shows the exact opposite. In many disciplines, telemedicine's actually been shown to offer a better product with higher patient satisfaction and similar, if not better, outcomes. The last thing I might mention, and I know this, there's a lot, of, uh, lot to say about this question, is patient demand. And, you know, I think about this in terms of we can now stream new release movies to our home. We can have packages delivered the next day. So I think a lot of our consumers are saying, why do I have to go to the clinic and take off work to go to the doctor's office? Um, so telemedicine, of course, it has its role in highly underserved communities, but maybe even in our uh, urban environments for, uh, for the working customer, patients, families, communities, even employers are really figuring out, okay, how can we make this technology work for us to make healthcare more accessible? One of the most impo important elements of ethical care is to get informed consent from your patient prior to beginning any course of treatment. Is it more difficult to achieve informed consent via a telemedicine setting than a traditional office setting? And if so, how should a physician practicing tele telemedicine alter his or her approach to achieving informed consent? Like informed consent is something we think a lot about with telemedicine. So I think it's easiest if we look at getting informed consent for telemedicine in a similar way that we'd look at it for any other procedure. So what I mean by this is that there's a precedent for having a separate consent form or, or an electronic form specifically authorizing the use of telemedicine. Usually this form will outline the risks and benefits specifically of telemedicine and specifically say that the patient has the right, of course, to decline telemedicine at any time. It, it's also, I think, a good idea as we're using electronic methods to have some type of privacy policy stating specifically how's this information going to be used, how will it be transmitted, maybe how will it be stored, as well as any potential security breaches that might be inherent to the software or the transmission. So you were talking about an electronic informed consent form, um, and I assume that would be uh, filed away in the electronic medical record. How do best practices for entering data into a medical record when it's acquired via telemedicine as opposed to face-to-face -face encounter differ? You know, documentation with telemedicine, even though uh, in some ways we're taking shortcuts along distance, that sort of thing, documentation is certainly something we can't take any shortcuts with. And so best practices for telemedicine include documenting not only that the practice occurred, of course, by telemedicine, but also in many um, sort of third-party payer situations, why was telemedicine used? Commonly, this might be because of no local provider being available. Today, if you want the service, this is the way we're offering it. It's also a good idea uh, to document each encounter, of course, that the patient has uh, renewed essentially their informed consent to telemedicine and that the provider or staff have explained the risks and limitations of the process of telemedicine itself. Many um, medical records, of course, now allow for electronic submission of our charges, of our ICD-10 diagnoses and CPT codes, and there may be additional procedure codes as well that should be documented and entered at both the origination, uh, where usually where the patient is at, and the receiving, where the provider is at sites. One of the greatest challenges in rural communities is access to health care. What advantages does telemedicine offer in treating these underserved populations in the United States? Also, Texas, one of the largest states in the country and one of the largest rural communities, recently made it more difficult to practice telemedicine. They no longer allow a doctor-patient uh, uh, relationship unless the patient and doctor meet face-to-face -face initially. How do you feel about that uh, sort of regulation? Yeah, Mike, and you know, maybe I'll start with, uh, with the regulation in Texas talking about the face-to-face -face, uh, encounter, and specifically what they're looking at there is the presence of a physical exam uh, that should be done at the first visit. And that's something that I know the American Telemedicine Association is looking at actively, as many states do not require this. And it's interesting, because if you think about many specialties, think of the radiologist, the pathologist, the dermatologist, so many of these services are being conducted flawlessly without the use of a physical exam already. So I think that this is one of the areas that's very uh, interesting, very innovative in the law that we're seeing right now. My expectation is that eventually what we're going to see as, uh, you know, looking at 2015 with over 200 laws passed in the United States just related to telemedicine, 
It's such a rapidly evolving field. And so I think we're going to see the pendulum swing a little bit between more conservative thinking and, and more progressive approaches, uh, especially as we look at our nation's needs for expanding services. You, you had mentioned that uh, more than 200 laws were passed in relation to telemedicine last year. What are some of the highlights? What are the great advances and what are the great hindrances that might have come out of, come out of 2015? 2015 was a really neat year, and I think that one of the biggest things that we're seeing is just innovation across the field, Mike. So we're seeing companies that are putting a doctor in people's smartphones, the ability to text message a doctor who could be anywhere. Um, we're seeing opportunities even on, on the web for companies, for patients to directly communicate with, say, a third-party dermatology service to upload a picture of that scary mole and get an opinion on it. Or maybe you do need to go in and get a biopsy or, or something, which may not always be the case. The laws lag a little bit behind. The neatest thing, I think the best highlight that we're seeing is that the case laws tend to be overwhelmingly progressive. They tend to be expanding telehealth and looking at ways that how else can we safely use this technology. Um, the incidences that I see of, of, say, physicians getting in trouble is when sort of the same things that we see them getting in trouble for in person, when they're practicing unsafely or outside of their scope of practice. As our viewers understand, medicine is both a business and an art. How does the reimbursement rate, the business side, vary from telemedicine, a telemedicine visit to a traditional doctor's office visit? Mike, I'm glad you asked that question. I, I think out of everything that we've talked about so far today, the reimbursement rate sort of remains one of the stickiest issues in telemedicine. It's something that I, I do think is going to be uh, worked out significantly in our professional careers, but it can vary a lot depending on the payer. Medicare is especially interesting as it has so many limitations on facility location and eligibility, what services might be eligible for uh, telemedicine, which providers can see a patient, and how claims are submitted. So there's actually a great summary of this. I'll refer to the American Telemedicine Association on their website, uh, just kind of outlining the Medicare laws. Interestingly, state Medicaid programs in general have had far less restrictions, but of course this will vary state by state. Commercial insurers is, it kind of opens up its own uh, box of worms, as each commercial payer might have its own set of limitations. So while I can't necessarily speak in sort of broad conclusions about reimbursement, I will say that, you know, sort of each situation requires a bit of background research, starting with the patient, starting with the payer, um, but certainly for health groups that are located and wor or work primarily with a certain uh, team of third-party payers, um, it'd be easy to look at sort of, say, your top five payers and see how do they incorporate telemedicine and, and what's accepted. Excellent. Well, that was a fascinating discussion of uh, telemedicine and, and uh, both its history and what we can expect in the future. Thank you for uh, your time, Dr. Terry. My pleasure, Mike. Thanks so much for having me on board.